let us give a very special untapped potential welcome to Captain Arthur Senhouse. And of course, if his last name sounds familiar, it is probably because you recognize it as my maiden last name. Captain Senhouse is actually my cousin. So we are first cousins and I'm very proud to be um, his cousin. So he is the Director of Flight Operations at LIAT, the Caribbean airline based in Antigua. And while I'm saying thank you for being here, uh, Captain Senhouse, I also want to thank your sister, Irma Marie, who yeah. was very instrumental about maybe 30 years ago when mm -hmm. she decided it was very important for the family in Antigua to know the family in Dominica. So if not for Irma, we probably would not be having this conversation. That's so true. thank you, Irma. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah, she is such a glue. Irma is such a glue. Oh, yeah. She's always bringing people together. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So yes. welcome to the program, um, uh, Captain, uh, Captain Senhouse. How are you? I'm doing well. Yes, doing yes. Well. So I gave a little introduction of who you are, but just tell us a little bit more of, about who you are. Well, like, like you introduced me in the first instance, um, my, my, my father, who happens to be your uncle, um, was born and grew up in Dominica. However, at a very early age, he moved to Antigua, where he met my mom, who is actually from Guadeloupe. Um, I, I consider myself to be a, a very... Um, sort of total Caribbean person. And I say so because um, while my mom and my, my dad um, originated from Guadeloupe and Dominica respectively, my wife happens to be Grenadian. Wow. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so like you say, um, thanks to Irma, my sister, she has always had this affinity to make sure that we, we know extended families. I, I refer to her as myancestry.com because anything I want to know, I can go to her. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I, I was born in Antigua, grew up in the, in, in the little village called Michael's Village, which happens to be um, adjacent. And we considered ourselves part of the Ovals community, where those of you who are cricket enthusiasts will know that um, Viv Richards came from just just a few houses down the road from where we live. So this, this is somebody who we know very well. Um, his mom, his dad, his brothers and stuff like that. So um, while, while I grew up in, um, in Michael's village, I attended what was um, originally the um, primary uh, Catholic school, part of um, Christ the King. And then after leaving Christ the King, I went to St. Joseph's Academy and completed my secondary education there. However, all that time, I, I don't remember when the aviation bug actually bit me. But um, from ever since, I have always um, wanted to, to, to be a pilot, to get into aviation. My other, my other passion really was, was law. And I still do have a little affinity for it, but um, I, I got myself really deeply involved in aviation. As a matter of fact, it was through Irma again, again. <laughs> that, that I met I met a, a young a young man um, who had just joined Liat as a pilot by the name of Russell Lee Foon. Very very nice guy from I remember from, Russell from from Trinidad. You remember Russell? I remember right. Russell and. Um, he had actually introduced me to my first flight instructor, Norman Martin, who actually had a small flying club here and was able to instruct and stuff like that. And um, through Russell, I was able to book a, a flight with Martin and um, just to see if I would like it or not. And, um, and from the very first time I even walked out to that little airplane, it was a little four-seater airplane, um, I thought, this, this is my dream, you mm -hmm. know? And this is all I wanted to do. Not to mention where our house was back in Michael's village, all the aircraft, because where we lived was just um, sort of west of the airport. So on final approach, all the aircraft used to fly right over my house. Mm -hmm. and 
think you're probably stuck stuck for a little while. But if you're just joining us, uh, we're speaking to Captain Arthur Senhouse of Very Antigua. Happy. Yeah, and um, I was able to 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 work and um, and join join the program that Martin Norman had, mm -hmm. and so I needed forty hours of flight time to qualify to write my first exam, mm. right? And I started that in 1984, right? And it took me, because I had to do it as I worked, mm -hmm. because we didn't, we, we, did, we weren't well off or anything. Mm -hmm. So I did that as I worked and dedicated myself to it. I never bought a car or anything. As a matter of fact, I rode my bicycle. Wow. I bought a bicycle because to get from where I was to the airport, I, I couldn't afford to pay a taxi or, mm -hmm. or get some form of transportation. So I bought a bicycle and um, rode from home to the airport every time I needed to go for a class. And I was able to achieve my 40 hours and wrote the exam. I passed the first one. Um, the first time I sat it, I passed. So I got my, what they refer to as a private pilot's license. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so what that, allowed me to do was to fly on my own and um, of course I would go to, to Guadeloupe in particular because I have a lot of family there so I take my sisters my mom and then we'll go across to Guadeloupe so on a private plane in in the plane I felt good because <laughs> there it is a little and I have to say this you know and I'm not saying this with any prejudice or anything but we refer I referred to myself as this little black boy from Ovals who came from a family fairly unknown to anybody, was able to go to the airport, hop in a little airplane, take his family across all by himself. They were very trusted. <laughs> yeah. And then and then we stay for the weekend and then we come back. We had our own mode of transport. Mm. So after I did that, I started looking to flying schools because by that time I was working at um, Cable and Wireless, which was a dream job of mine. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I was able, because we work shift, I was able to work mostly night shifts. So then I could get a chance to, to fly about during the day. And um, while doing that, I remember at that time we had no internet, no cell phones, mm -hmm. no, no, no computers to, to go on. So I had to um, rely on things like um, magazines and ask questions about flight schools and things like that, because I needed to complete the, the licenses and to be to be able to get a job as a as a commercial pilot you need four licenses mm -hmm. you need your private pilot's license you need your commercial license and um your instrument rating and the last one you would get with it would enable you to be a captain on any size of aircraft which they refer to as your, your advanced pilot license all right so i did two licenses in antigua my private and my commercial. And I was able through my mom to apply for a student loan at the Antigua Commercial Bank. And I believe it or not, I got the first student loan that that bank gave, right? So I was able to go to Moncton in Canada, in New Brunswick, and there I completed my instrument rating and commercial license. Mm -hmm. And then when I came back to Antigua, I applied to Liat and they hired me. You wow know, I, that I'm, is a that is a beautiful yeah. story oh yeah and I've, yeah. I've been there ever since mm -hmm. um, and it's it's just over 32 years yes yes i started as a co-pilot i rose i i was a co-pilot on the 19 seat at twin Otto, mm -hmm. and then i became a co-pilot on the dash eight which mm -hmm. was you now the 37 and 50 seater aircraft and during that time i was also picked um by the older captains to become a, a flight instructor mm -hmm. but but but, but even know. before we speak about liat because we certainly want to hear about your experiences about <laughs> liat but you yeah. know on this program we, we talk a lot about uh challenges and successes and yeah. you've already shared some of the sacrifices you had to yeah. make such as buying a bicycle to yeah. get to classes but just kind of tell us about the challenges you faced when you left home for the first time and went to canada well that uh, that is quite a story I had never been um, 
to, to, to North America or anything, right? And so, well, you know, I was all excited. Um, I actually, I actually got to Canada on my birthday, which was the 24th of March. I'll, I'll never forget it, right? And that was the first time. And when I went there, you know, the 24th of March is in the dead of winter. Yes, it is. You're talking about, you're talking about up at the Northeast in Canada, right? All I knew about that place at the time was that we, that's where we got sardines from, New Brunswick <laughs> sardines. That's yes. all I knew, yes. right? Not to mention, I never saw sardines up there at all, right? Um, but when I got there, I was so ill-prepared. Oh, were you? I had no idea as to what snow was or how cold it could get. And how and old were you? How old were you? I was, I was 24 years old. Right, I was 24 at the time. Um, a young man mm -hmm. landed in this place. Um, so I, I got there, it was a Sunday. I, I think it was a Sunday. And so I had to find my way to a bank. Now remember, there, there were hardly any credit cards and things mm -hmm. like that. I had this, I had this, um, this um, what it was, it was the, the check from the bank. Here in Antigua, that I had to now go to a bank and, deposit. and open an account deposit, walk with all my documents to tell them I'm a student and things like that. And would you believe it or not, I got lost. <gasps> right? And so all I had was what we refer to in the Caribbean as a windbreaker. Mm -hmm. It was a light mm -hmm. plastic type jacket, yes. you know. And um, I remember I walked, I walked, I asked for directions and stuff like that. I probably just took the wrong turn somewhere. <laughs> and I ended up in the opposite direction to where I was supposed to go. They said I needed to go to this big building. It would have been a big black building in the middle of town called the CN Tower. Wow. I was and I just missed it. And I ended up somewhere on a waterfront next to a single pump gas station. I remember that. And I stood up there, 24 years old, and I cried. Wow. I can I, imagine. I you're thought, overwhelmed. And you're I cold. Thought, you're cold. I thought I, yeah, I thought I was going to die. And I said, could you imagine nobody knows me and I'm going to die in this cold place? <laughs> and you can't get on your cell phone and, and call your mom on WhatsApp. <laughs> you, can't, you can't do that. You can't do that. So I took the courage and I, I, I knocked on the door by the little gas station. And there was an a, a elderly gentleman there. And I asked him if I could just come in for a minute. And he said, yeah, come in, you know. And he said, what, what, what's your issue? And I said, well, I'm looking for the CN Tor because I need to get to the Royal Bank of Canada because I'm a student at the Moncton Flight Center. He knew. So he said, no problem, man. I can, I can show you where that is. So he took me back outside after a little while I got to warm up and he pointed me in the right direction. Well, girl, when I got to that place, right? And I came out because now I had, I had a bit of cash. And in, in that place, it was like a big mall as well. So I just went. And when I came out of that building, nobody could recognize me because I had earmuffs. I had gloves, a big, big coat. Oh, you, yeah. you just could not see me. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was one of my great, great challenges mm -hmm. when I got up here. Had no idea, no idea whatsoever. And going back, going back to my bicycle story, mm -hmm. would you believe that you know what we call susu, right? We yes. call it we call yes, box susu. Money, is where people put monies together, everybody gets some mm -hmm. at the end of the week. And the first bicycle I bought to do that, I had parked it outside a neighbor's house and somebody stole it. Wow. And it took me, it took me the better part of a month <laughs> to save up money again right. because I bought it in parts and put it together. Mm -hmm. You know, so that, 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 it, it was not just a breeze for me to get to where I, to where I got eventually. Right. But, um, but I could always sit back and, and, and laugh at it and, mm -hmm. and time with it and share it. You know? Yes. Yeah, so I want to talk about your experience um, in Canada, but for anyone who's just joining us, we're speaking to Captain Arthur Senhouse, 
out of Antigua. Yes, he is my cousin of the last name Senhouse, and he's the director of flight operations at LIAT. And I'm sure we have a lot of questions about the status of LIAT, but before we even touch on that, he's just sharing the sacrifices and his experiences and the challenges he faced when he went to Canada to uh, obtain his degree and become a pilot. So I think one of the things I experienced coming from Dominica and moving to the US was how different the school system oh, was. Yeah. Was that a challenge for you? Oh, I yeah. didn't even understand what a credit was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. And, and the way they would, they would um, conduct the classes and stuff. And in flight school in particular, in flight school in particular, it's almost, while they have universal classes, it's almost an individual sort of curriculum mm -hmm. because you go at your pace. I remember when I got there, I met several other people from, from different places in the world. I always remember there was one guy who stood out to me um, up to today, and he was a prince from, um, from Nepal, mm -hmm. and his name was Prince Bikash. He is the one who taught me to play table tennis. Mm -hmm. I always remember that. He was from Nepal. Very, very good friend of mine. And then I also, I had a roommate. I don't know if you know the former president of Italy, Berlusconi, mm -hmm. Silvio Berlusconi. Right. His son was actually my roommate at the time when I was Impressive. in Canada. Yeah. Yep, yep. Impressive. So I got to meet a broad cross section of people. Yeah. Um, some of the instructors I had were not only Canadian, but some were from Pakistan and Africa and stuff yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. So it really gave me a broad perspective on different types of cultures and yeah and like would you say it expanded your horizon in terms oh, of yeah, you know coming yeah. from a tiny island and meeting oh, so yeah. many people oh, from yeah. around I, the world? I, I, yeah, I didn't feel as lonely because a lot of these other kids, they came from fairly humble beginnings as well, mm -hmm. right? So we had a lot in common, a lot to share, and we're in this big city, mm -hmm. you know, although Canadians consider Moncton to be a small place, but we considered it a big city because we, we didn't have those things where we came from. Mm -hmm. So it was, it, was, it was a pretty, pretty good experience for me. Good. And the weather, it, it taught me how to respect nature. Nature. Because it, it could go from from being a nice, nice day to, to 20, 25 degrees below zero in a hat, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know, and especially as it was right on the waterfront up in the Northeast, the mm -hmm. weather could change on a dime. Yeah. And that's one of the things I, I when, when young people come and ask me about um, um, ideas and where to go to flight school and things like that, I always recommend it mm -hmm. because you, you, you come out of, of that situation feeling very, very accomplished, mm -hmm. well-trained. It's a very, very good system they have in Canada. Yeah, you know? good. So how many, how many years were you in Canada? Well, because I had, I had started it here. Flight school itself is, is normally a very short program, mm -hmm. right? So because I had gone there with um, some level of experience and I had two out of the, out of the four licenses already, I spent from March until August of that same year mm -hmm. because I didn't, I didn't take any breaks. I didn't go back home. I just stayed there day in, day out and went through the program. There's a lot of the people I met there, I left them there. Wow. Because after a while, you can, once, you, once you qualify to write the exams and do the flight checks, mm -hmm. they will let you do it, right? Um, an instructor would evaluate you, and once he is satisfied that you can do it, they will get an inspector from the Department of Transport on the mm -hmm. aviation side to come and do the flight check with you. You have to, you had to go down to that same CN tower at the Department of Transport. <laughs> Did you get lost I, again? <laughs> oh, I, I, I never got lost. Never got lost after that. And then your lesson. I was good at it. So I just kept going with mm -hmm. it un, until I was finished. Mm -hmm. And the day after I did my last flight check, I, I was so homesick, right? Mm -hmm. I just packed everything in my suitcase, pulled it across because where I lived, it was right across. The flight school was actually on the airport. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just went across the Air Canada had seats and I was <laughs> heading home. Wow. Heading home. <laughs> oh, yeah. But the thing about flight school is that all you, you, what you get really is a license so that you can get a job. Mm -hmm. once you get once you become a commercial pilot 
that's when the learning really starts. Interesting. And it's it's a, a lot of people don't understand, but what happens, we're the only profession in the world that I know of that every six months, every six months, a pilot's job, a commercial pilot's job is on the line. Mm -hmm. right? Because every six months, you have to go back into the classroom. You have to go into the simulator. You have to do it all over again. Right, because people's right? lives are on stake. Yeah. Every six months, you got it. I know, I know guys get very nervous mm -hmm. because, you know, if you fail um, and some companies have a three strikes and you're out kind of rule, you fail three times in your career. You could mm -hmm. be there for a long time. Once you fail three times, they tell you it's time to go. So you even know? when you become a captain. Oh, yes. Everybody has to go through that every mm -hmm. six months. And if if you if you suffer uh, an an illness that's debilitating, you could lose your license. I know mm -hmm. there, there there are a couple of guys around my time in the act and up to up to not too long ago who had to be medically boarded because their health wasn't mm -hmm. allowing them to hold their license. Mm -hmm. Because we have to go to the doctor every six months as well. You and do complete medical, yeah, right, yeah. Right. So not only your skill set. But your health can take you out. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you if your eyesight depreciates below a certain level, that's it. You're finished. Mm -hmm. You know, just the other day, a good, a very good friend of mine who works in the office with me as well, he suffered a mild heart attack, and his license got suspended for six months. Wow. He had to go and do some surgery in, in the states and things like that. So when he got when he got back, you know, his medical you now his your, your medical certificate in a pilot's license is what validates your license. Mm -hmm. You have to do that first, and then you go and do your flight training and your flight checks. Mm -hmm. So some people get very nervous over it. Um, some people just don't like it, mm -hmm. you know. So we, we try to make it as, as amicable as we can and make sure, because I think the nerves come because um, you're going to do things that you don't normally do on a normal flight, mm -hmm. right? You're going to go through all the emergency procedures right. and, and, you know, you might get an engine fire, an engine failure. Um, you know, the, the pressurization in the cabin may go because, mm -hmm. you know, when you find the, the flight attendant always tell you just in case of, of rapid decompression, the oxygen mask will fall and you take it. Well, we are on the other side of that, mm -hmm. right? So we have to train in order to let the, well, you know, because yeah. you, you applied it in a long time. So you know exactly what I'm speaking about, but people do get nervous and get a little, you know, a little um, agitated about it, but mm -hmm. we do the briefs and the debriefings and make sure that people are comfortable. Yeah. All and all all, you know, it's, it's been, it's been pretty good to me. Yes. I love it. I love it. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. And, and of course, we're going to talk about your, your journey of climbing the ladder at um, Riyadh <laughs> because you've made it all That's the way to else. direct a flight That's operations. Yeah. Yeah. So we're speaking to yes. Captain yes. Senhouse, yes. the director of flight operations at Riyadh, and he's just walking us through his successes and challenges that he's faced. And we're so happy that he's joining us today because he's a very busy man. I promise you, it's been months <laughs> we've been trying to get this interview in. <laughs> And because he has such a hectic schedule, as I'm sure you can imagine, we've yeah. only now had the opportunity to sit down for this interview. So we're so happy that he is joining us today. So Captain, just kind of walk us through um, the getting, beginning at Liat and how you were able to climb the corporate ladder within Liat. <laughs> I never planned to. Mm -hmm. I never planned to. My, my dream was to sit in a cockpit until the day I get to 65 and retire. Mm -hmm. that, that has always been my dream. Um, however, I don't know, for some strange reason, I seem to end up taking up challenges that, that I didn't plan to. And I think that journey started because um, I'm a very curious individual. I like to learn things. And, and because of that, I ask a lot of questions. I remember as, as a young pilot, there was one of my mentors, um, Captain Richard King, who I always considered to be um, 
a, a natural, naturally brilliant person when it came to understanding the physics and the chemistry of flight and how the aircraft work and things like that. And I remember when we got, when we got our first new Dash 8, the 50-seater, I had noticed something about it. And one of the things I had noticed was that we didn't have what we, what we used to call on the Dash 100, the smaller one, a climb chart. And that was just a chart with a set of numbers that as, as you pass certain altitudes, you had to make sure that the power setting was at a particular number. So I had asked him one day, you know, how come we don't have that? So instead of answering me, he said, come with me. And he took me into the library and he gave me these two huge manuals, right? And he said, I'm going to show you something and I'm going to give you these two books and you go home and create one of those charts, mm. right? And so, okay, I said, but I don't think I could do that. He said, no, you can do it. I will show you how to start it and I know you can do it. So he gave it to me and I said, oh, it took me, it took me about two weeks and I figured it out. And I and I and I, I I documented it, and I took the numbers back to him, and he said, "You see, I told I told you you could do it." But then after I did all of that, he said, "You know, now that you have done it, what I will tell you is that we don't necessarily need it." Oh my lord! Because the aircraft has an automatic system in it that it will set the power. Um, based on the altitude you're climbing through. And then he explained it to me and we got into it and I realized, but we kept it, we kept it and they actually went ahead and modified it and put it on each of the aircraft. Mm -hmm. So because of that and, and because of my interaction with him and, and my, my um, affinity to, to, to learn things, if there was something going on and they asked for a volunteer to, to sit on a committee or to look into something where pilots may be having an issue or something like that, I would always raise my hand and do it. Fast forward a bit, yeah, up, to, up to about 2011, um, I, I became a member of the, of the executive committee for the, um, pilots, for the pilots union. And in 2011, um, I was nominated, you know, they asked me, would you become the, the chairman or the president of, of the group? And I said, okay, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. They had an election, I won. And I, I did that for a year. But what that did for me, that gave me a greater insight into the, the, the industrial side of things because now I would have to interact a lot more with management. And I remember one day we had a new CEO and that was back in 2012. And I got a call from HR and she said, you know, the CEO would like to, to see you at around 1230. Hmm. So I'm thinking, what the hell could I have done? Because I know I, 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 I'm not normally in trouble or anything. So anyway, when, when I went up to headquarters, um, both himself and the director of, of HR, they said, well, we're going to lunch. So what we will do, you come with us and we'll have lunch and we'll discuss with you what we, what we ask you to come for. So anyway, during lunch and things like that, the, the CEO then told me, he said, you know, we, um, we have been monitoring you for a while and a vacancy is going to come up because the, the chief pilot at the time was coming up for retirement. And they say, you know, we think that you would be a good fit for it. I said, but I, have, I really have no interest in it. I just want to fly the airplane just want to fly. by myself. And he said, well, well, you know, think about it. And we're going to put out the, the, the vacancy notice and at least apply, go through the interview. Now, by, by 2012, I would have been in Liat for, for just about, um, I would say I joined in 87. So I would have been there just about 25 years already. And after 1987, I had not done an interview. I had not applied for any work or anything. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I'm going to have to dig deep now because if, I, if I'm going to be called for an interview, I have to do some preparation. So, but anyway, I did tell them that if, if I were to be considered, I would like to enroll myself in a, a business management course mm -hmm. or anything. 
anyhow, we fast forward a little bit and um, I did get a chance to go to the interview. But because I, I was always looking to learn things, I became very proficient at things like Word and Excel and PowerPoint and computer things and stuff like that. So I was able to go to the interview. Then I get a call and said, well, you're on the short list. Wow. But there are people better than me who I consider to be better than me. Anyway, they, they, they picked me and I told them, well, look, I, I, I would do this for three months, right? Because really I have no interest. <laughs> I would do it for three months and we'll see how it goes. So they were happy and they, they gave me the opportunity to do it. However, funny it is, right? Now that I was appointed um, and put on probation in February of 2014, right? Um, by that time, the, the chief pilot had re retired and handed over to me. However, my BFO, which is the director of flight ops, there was an incident and um, he was terminated, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Now, the way the hierarchical structure in the org chart works is that the, the chief pilot will always deputize for the DFO. So here I am in February and towards the end of March, he gets terminated. Mm -hmm. So I am now a brand new person in the seat holding two of the top positions wow. in an air, right? <laughs> and so I, I said, no, I, I am not going to do this. This is just too much. But I have to say, um, I, by that time, by that time, I had already gone um, probably a few months into the course. I had, I had registered in the, in, the, um, in the college here to do a, a business administrator's course. Right. So by that time, I started to get some knowledge as to how things work in the business administration standpoint. And so I would go to work from eight o'clock in the morning um, till five in the afternoon and leave straight from my office and go to class from five till nine in the wow. night. And I, I did that. And I had to because of the pressures of um, holding two positions at the same time I'm going through that learning curve. I took a few, I took almost a year off um, that business administration course. And then once I gathered myself again and I started to, to get accustomed um, to it, I, I went back into the course and I finished it. Actually, I finished it in 20, 2019, October mm -hmm. of 2019. And that, that really, really blew my mind. It really put me in a much better place. So now, having not wanting to do it, I didn't really want to do it. I'm so happy I did it. And I got a, a lot of encouragement from the new CEO who had come on. Um, and he, he told me, he told me, welcome to baptism by fire. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, so it, it, it took a chunk out of me. It really did, but I don't regret having done it. It was a lot of hard work because I'm now sitting at a top position in a, in a, in a big company, a lot of responsibility. Um, people's lives are in my hands yes. when those things go in the ear. Um, I have a lot of, my, my, my department is the biggest department in the company. Mm -hmm. It takes over two thirds of the employees, right? Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of sub departments that I have to do, but at the end of the day, I manage, I saw it through and um, I have to say, with a lot of prayer and, and relying on my spiritual side of things, that, that gave me the, the opportunity and the skill sets to really embrace it mm -hmm. and take it to another level. I, I was able to make some, what I consider to be some good revolutionary changes in the department, mm -hmm. get people to appreciate more than what they want to do. Because I, I thought that um, a lot of times when, when people get up, on the ladder, they, they tend to forget. So I, I tend to, I, I never, nobody could ever find me in my office. Mm. I, 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 I was one who always, I needed to be with people and get mm. from the other departments. How, how do we create a link? Why is this not working? What is it that we can do to help you? Because the whole airline is, a, is, a, is like a chain link fence. Mm -hmm. You know, there are many different parts, but they're all connected. 
Mm-hmm. And so from, from that standpoint, you know, I would, I would walk the whole, walk from up by the hangar, which, which you're familiar with, yes. all the way down to the airport. Mm-hmm. So I would hardly, I tell anybody, if you want me, call me on my cell phone. Right. I always have it because I can't sit in my office. Mm-hmm. And that, that's really why I like devices and things. So my secretary would send me a document and I go on my iPad and I would sign it right. and send it back to her. So mm-hmm. it gives me a chance to be mobile. But then it also gave me a chance to learn a lot about the other departments and how we could connect it and make the, the airline run better. Mm-hmm. And I've been part of a team which, which I played a very key role in through my department to improve our on-time performance. That was right. one of the challenges our first female CEO gave us, gave me in mm-hmm. particular. She wanted us to be able to be on time at yes. least 70% of the time. Mm-hmm. And in a matter of months, we achieved that and we were able to take it over 80%. So she came back now and she gave me a new KPI. She says, from next month, I want us to keep that KPI at 80%. I said, mm-hmm. oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. The moving we targets. Did we did it. We did it. And, and we were able to, to be registered on this website called flightstats.com, mm-hmm. which is an independent company. And it just looks at the statistics of airlines and puts them into groups. So we were in Latin America and the Caribbean. And we were able in 2018 to get right up out of 13 airlines to number two. Wow. On many, many occasions. That for me was a, was a proud achievement, a proud moment, because I was able to put that in my board report, the report mm-hmm. to the board, and say, this is what we have become. So yeah. it... it you know, I was able to be part of something that really put Liat on a pinnacle, mm-hmm. you know, not mm-hmm. to mention our, our impeccable safety record. You know? Yes, yes, very important. And, and you know, um, what, that's one of the challenges of, of people speak about a lot, the challenge yeah. of being on time. So I kind of yeah. want to talk about some of the challenges Liat has faced over the years. But of course, I just want to remind everyone we are speaking to Captain Arthur Senhouse out of Antigua. He's the Director of Flight Operations and he's told us all about his wonderful journey of becoming a pilot, his, his ability to climb the ladder of just being curious and being willing to learn. So I think we're taking away many lessons from you, um, Captain. So thank you so much for sharing those with us. And and as you mentioned, as a former flight attendant with Liat, I have to say my experience was wonderful. I, only, I was only there for about a year, but I had the pleasure of working with you, working with Irma Marie, working with your wife, Celia. It's like yeah. we took over the entire company <laughs> yes. we, at one point. Only. And my brother in law Kelvin. And your brother, yes, I remember Kelvin as well. So it was it was a family business on many levels. <laughs> on many levels. Oh yes. <laughs> So just kind of, um, as we get ready to wind on in a little while, just kind of walk us through some of the challenges Liat has faced in the past and what is the status of Liat currently? Yeah. Well, to begin with, um, while Liat has been around for just over 60 years, um, the common common thing that has really challenged it over those years is something we refer to in economics as on the capitalization. And while a lot of times... People would say, well, the governments need to come out of it, which a few of them had um, last year. I always used to look back at it and say, well, the same thing that we seem to, to, to blame for having it where it is, is the same thing that bails us out all the time. Mm-hmm. And it's government. Mm-hmm. Um, I know we went through a fleet change. Since I've been there, we have gone through um, two major fleet changes. Because when I joined, they had the 48-seater um, Avros, which you would have been familiar with as well. Mm-hmm. And then we changed to all dashes. We got rid of the small airplanes and we got all dashes. We have land dashes out of Canada. In 2012, we started the major fleet change because the dashes were now becoming old. And we changed to the, to the newer, greener, as they call it. Um, more efficient ATR aircraft, which, which I'd grown to love because it's um, the technology on it is just amazing. Um, having said that now, um, the challenges we faced had to do with a lot of um, new regulations coming in. Um, 
especially when it when it came to uh, when it came to competition and stuff like that. And the governments, especially especially Barbados, um, figured we we need to restructure it. We need to privatize it. We need to do it over, so to speak. However, while while that was on the cards in in 2019, because I had attended a meeting where where the prime ministers were present, Rav Gonzalez, Gaston Brown, and and Mia Motley were present, and and it's in it's in their presence. It was announced that that Barbados wanted to sell its shares for a dollar, and Prime Minister Gaston Brown jumped up and said, "Well, I will have it." Liat Liat was created in Antigua, and Antiguans are very proud of it. They believe it's theirs, and I think they have a right to believe that because Antigua has come to the rescue of Liat from from the from its inception. So when the the whole thing with the pandemic came about, I think it just gave um, some of the other governments the opportunity to say, well, we don't know how long this is going to last, so we might as well fold it up. While all of that was going on, and Liat was supposed to have been folded up in on the 31st of July 2019, uh, 2020, um, the government here decided that they won't allow that to happen. So they created the new part of the constitution that housed the bankruptcy rules. And um, from that, they placed, um, more or less unilaterally, they placed Liat into bankruptcy. So now we have it on the administration. So we laid off um, just over 500, and I think it's about 580 of our 677 staff. And we went right down to just from 10 airplanes, we now down to three airplanes. However, the government of Antigua and Barbuda has decided that they're going to try to get some investors to look at Liat. And for that purpose, we had been encouraged to put the airplanes back in the air. So we are now operating on a limited schedule. We started from about December. And there are a few investors who seem to be interested. And um, the court has given the company some latitude. So while we're in bankruptcy, as you know, nobody can, no creditor can come and, and shut you down or put you in court and things like that. So we have a bit of protection. And um, I'm hoping that somewhere by the end of April, between April and June, we'll have a clear idea as to where we will end up. Um, while we have been put back into service, though on a very limited schedule, um, the whole uptick in the COVID, um, in the COVID casualties and infection rate has really pushed us back just a little because now in Antigua, we, we, our curfew hours are from 6 to 5, 6 p.m. to 5 a.m. Um, Barbados is almost on a total lockdown. The embassy in Barbados has decided to um, stop the visa appointments. So what they're doing now is everything is electronic. So that has taken some passengers away as well. But we, our intention with the government of Antigua and Barbuda is to stay the course because now that the vaccines have, have started to come through the Caribbean and we have to really give a lot of praise and thanks, we can't do it enough to Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt for providing Antigua, Barbados and some of the other islands. Um, we got 5,000 doses which started to have been administered as of, as of yesterday to the healthcare workers. So we are forever indebted to, to the people of Dominica um, for their Prime Minister having done that for us and put us on a better path. We are hopeful that we'll be able to climb out of bankruptcy and then put Liat back on the map as a much better, leaner brand of aviation. And so I'm, I'm fairly hopeful. Um, you know, the staff at Liat who remain, we work tirelessly. Um, sometimes months we don't get paid because we know there is no money. But people still show up because they have this genuine love for this Caribbean institution called Liat. And so we're doing it, we have pledged that we're going to do it so that we can get, if not all, but the majority of our brothers and sisters back into employment, back into aviation. So it's a sacrifice that we all had to, had to take. It hasn't been easy. Um, 
you know, because it's, you know, you're working, you have to drive, you have to put gas, you have to find food and things like that, you know. Um, so we work with the government and whenever they're able, they will help us with the little revenue that we make to pay staff and to pay for some of the things. So for me, it's been, it's been, um, while it's been tough, it's been quite a learning experience because now we have to dive a lot deeper into, into the um, granules of the industry and to work with um, um, establishments and groups like IATA, the International Airline Transport Association, um, and the regulators and FAA and DOT, you know, have a good rapport with the people at FAA, you know, so if any, there's any challenge or anything, we can always reach out to them. So it's been, it's been, like I say, I have not had a day where we have not learned something new. You know, even last night I, I stayed up, I fell asleep and then I, I got up to look at some, um, some ways that we can, we can develop, you know, and manage the expense versus the cost versus the ticket prices, see why, what it is that we can do in this time of heavy restrictions to get people to travel because people want to travel, you know? So I'm very, very optimistic that with the introduction of the vaccine, that will remove the need for people to be quarantined because that's the biggest obstacle for people traveling. Nobody's going to want to travel except they have to and go somewhere to stay 14 days locked in a room, you know? So, so for me, that, that has really, that has really given me a lot of encouragement this week to see that the vaccines are rolled out and we're now able to do that. Yes. So where Liat is right now is that we are just working on a very limited budget, very limited schedule. And um, we are back to about uh, just over 140 people across the network, mm -hmm. across the Caribbean. So for us, it's just about staying the course. I think we have... From my, from my knowledge and understanding of where we are, I think in about the next two months, we will start to see an increase in travel as people get vaccinated and they start to remove some of the restrictions on, um, on quarantine. You know? Well, thank you. So, well, thank you so much. Uh, I, I think you're in a good place. Yeah, so thank you so much, Captain Sandhouse, for being with us and for sharing all about your personal experiences as well as the status of Liat. Do you have any final words for us as we wrap up? Well, like I always say, um, one of the things, because I, I, I remember doing an interview, and it's funny, I did an, inter an interview with a young lady who came to for an interview as a pilot at Liat. And when she met me, she said, you know, I, 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 I feel like I know you because she said she read in the newspaper while she was back in Trinidad. Somebody had asked me a question about Liat and I, say, I, I said on that occasion, which was several years before I met her, that um, Liat, while it is a Caribbean institution, it is important for the governments to keep it going because that's the dream, hope, and aspiration of a lot of little Caribbean boys and girls mm -hmm. where they can stay home and become what they want to be. Mm -hmm. So for me, Liat is not just me, not just about anybody else, but it's really about the generation to come mm -hmm. so that people can feel just like a, a, a child can grow up and go to be a doctor and come back and work in a hospital home. We should, we should strive as Caribbean people to make sure that we create those entities where people can come back home with their expertise and give something back to the community and enjoy it because it mm -hmm. has been quite a joy for me. Yes, There's absolutely. The world, it has opened me to a lot of things. So it's more for, for, for the, the hopes and dreams of the little boys and girls, you know? So yes. when they sit down on their step, like I did, and mm -hmm. they see at Passover, they can say, I can do that. Yes, well, yes. Reach, you know? So mm -hmm. that, that, that's, that's, what, that's what keeps me going. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Captain Senhouse. Thank you for joining us on Untapped Potential with Dr. Simone. It's been a pleasure having you. It's been a pleasure reconnecting with you. We haven't seen each other in about 25 years. Oh, yes. So oh, yes. it's been a while. 
Oh, but yeah. it's been a pleasure reconnecting with you. And again, thank you, Irma thank you. Marie, um, my other cousin, oh, yeah. for setting this yeah. up for us and yeah. for making sure that we stay connected as a family. So it's Definitely. been a pleasure having you. And thank you. I'm happy I got to do this. I'm yes. really happy I got to do it. Yes, thank Thanks you so much. And great to see you. Yes, same here. Okay. Say hi to the family in Antigua for I'll me. definitely do that. All right, take care. Okay, take uh -huh. care. Bye. Thank you.